Kalisha, let me just open up. Uh, I just want to get to this. I am so excited about this book. Uh, I am so excited about learning more about Nan Nanny Helen Burroughs. Uh, and I have all the questions, but you know, I'm going to try to be cool tonight and let somebody else answer some, <laughs> ask some questions, but I have them all. I can take the whole hour because this is so good. So let me just open up. Can you just tell us a little bit about, um, just a little bit about the book and what the reader should expect? Right. So um, the first question um, as to um, giving you some background on why I wrote the book, et cetera, <laughs> I want to contextualize that question. The first thing I will say, I love the um, quote that Toni Morrison um, said, and she, and it was basically that I wrote my first book because or but I wrote my I wrote my first book because I wanted to read it. Mm. And so that kind of contextualizes um, in one sense why I wanted to write this um, piece on Dr. Burroughs. The fact that there was I had a desire to learn more about her, but there wasn't any content um, in terms of any extensive mm -hmm. content that I thought um, was suitable and th that that would really feed my appetite, if you will. But mm -hmm. also, I want to contextualize that question through a short activity that I would like the audience to participate in because it will give um, a more in-depth view that um, that will provide some sustenance in terms of helping the audience to understand what the purpose of this work is. So if the audience would be so kind as to go to menti.com, that is M-E-N-T-I dot com. And if you would enter in the code as you see it displayed on the screen, that is 11873651. And the question is, when you think about historical African-Americans in the U.S., what comes to mind? What words come to mind? This is an activity that I do with my students every semester. At the beginning of every semester, um, I, I open up with this question and the responses I get are always um, quite interesting. But if your audience would please go to um, menti.com and type in the code, we'll see if, um, if, if we can get some participation in this activity. And that code again is 11873651. I'm sure um, access to it will also be provided in the chat. So I see some answers coming in. All right, we have brave, committed, long suffering, overlooked, strong, very good. All right, powerful. Okay. All right, we'll wait for some more data to come in. And what this is doing is helping us to understand what our collective consciousness is as it relates to who people believe historical African descended people are. Okay, inspiring, resilient, strong. All right, resourceful, that's a good one. Excellent, committed, brilliant, underrepresented. Very good. Divine, okay, MLK. I, I, no matter how many times I do this, um, the people always um, ensure that they put MLK in there. That's wonderful. Inspiring, brilliant, slavery. Very good, okay. Men, huh, that's an interesting one. Men, revered, okay, strength, strong, powerful, divine. I love that divine one. Um, I think Dr. Burroughs would have embraced that adjective as well. Strong. So the words that are bigger are the ones that more people are saying. So we'll give it a couple more seconds. All right. Overlooked, powerful, divine, resilience, loyal, okay. Loyal, that's a good one. Committed, excellent, excellent, very good. Survivors, that's an excellent one. Survivors, indeed, survivors. Loyal, long suffering, yes, indeed, long suffering. Love, okay, love, overlooked, determined, powerful. Again, struggle, slavery. Excellent, excellent. Wonderful. So what I'm gonna do is um, now transition us again to um, Dr. Johnson's first question as to why I wrote this book. Whenever I do this activity with my students, I, we put, um, you know, we, just, we have the word cloud displayed and I asked ask them and I said, look at 
um, the list that we have here. This represents our collective consciousness as to who you believe African descended people are. And, and inevitably every semester, the um, regular answers reoccur, slavery, sometimes they say Jim Crow or beat down, all of the pathologies that we um, associate with blackness. And so I always ask my students, I said, what's the one word that you don't see up here? And everybody's like, I don't know, we said everything. The one word that never seems to make the list is thinker. Every happens every time. The one word that never seems to make the list is thinker, mm -hmm. which lets me know that fundamentally we don't, when we think about historical African Americans, we don't conceptualize them as thinkers, right? Oftentimes when we talk about African American history, it's about what black folks did, marching and you know, boycotting and sit-ins and all, what we did. But rarely do we get an aspect of who African descended people were as thinkers, right? And for me, that was a critical piece because in order to be a thinker, you have to have a keen sense of your own historicity. Historicity mm -hmm. is, a, is a complicated word that simply means understanding yourself as a being in space and time, right? Mm -hmm. When you have a keen sense of your own historicity, you understand that you have impact upon time, right? That your life has impact, right? Kojito ergo mm -hmm. sum, I think, therefore I am. And so part of the, the justification, if you will, for why I wrote this book is that I wanted to position Burroughs as a thinker, right? So often, as I said, we're accustomed to what um, Black women did, but we don't always, our knee-jerk response when we think about them is not to say that Black women are thinkers or Black people in general are thinkers. And so, again, thank you to the audience for helping me to contextualize my answer. I know we went all the way around Robin Hood's bend, but nevertheless, we still <laughs> ended at the destination that I wanted. <laughs> but yeah, in, in a nutshell, I wanted to position Burroughs as a thinker, as somebody who understood that her life had impact upon the environment and the society that she lived in. Wonderful. So let's let's talk a little bit more. And that's 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 beautiful, actually, because I want to talk about uh, about the black intellectual tradition. But mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit more about Nanny Helen Burroughs. We may have heard of the name. Um, some folk who are maybe associated with the National Baptist Convention and mm -hmm. especially the Women's Convention probably heard the name. Uh, and and so, or seeing the name floating around on uh, a building or or somewhere. But who was this wonderful woman, Nanny yeah. Helen Burroughs? Yes, thank you for that question. Nanny Helen Burroughs was the grand black woman, if you will, who started out as a little black girl in Orange County, Virginia. <laughs> she is the daughter, or was the daughter rather, of formerly enslaved parentage. But she was born into an environment um, where she was surrounded by people who were in fields of service, her father. Um, however haphazard he may have been, some say he, he wasn't around, some say he wasn't around because he passed away. So there's um, some debate there. But her father was a minister. He was a, he was a preacher. Her mother was a domestic, but she was a Sunday school teacher. So she's surrounded by people who are involved in fields of service. And so early on in life, she understands that um, part of who, part of what it means to contribute to the race is to be a person um, who gives their life to service. Um, she moves to DC, her mother moves the family to DC when she's about five years old so that nanny can have a greater bandwidth of opportunities that would be available to her. I often describe her as a woman with a big mind who was pro prodigiously gifted. She had the gift of gab, but was also endowed with equal amounts of foresight and insight. She had a wide angle view of the future, but was still able to understand and, and um, help folks navigate mm. the terrain that they mm. were in. So um, I, I describe her as a grand mosaic of a woman. If you look at a mosaic, and I just love that word. 
you know, you look at a mosaic, some pieces are small, some pieces are big, some are kind of jagged on, some are kind of rough on the edges. But when you pull back on it, what you see is a grand portrait that makes sense. Mm. So Burroughs is a grand mosaic of a woman. And when readers encounter much of her thought in the book, it, it some of it may seem like, wow, how is she saying this stuff? Right. But again, um, these are the pieces mm. Um, that that made this um, grand woman. She has a she has a speech where she calls um, the black woman. She says the Negro woman is a mighty big woman. And so, if you want to know who Dr. Burroughs is, just think about that. She was a mighty <laughs> big woman. Wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I like that too. The whole notion of someone being uh, um, this portrait, this mosaic. Right. Yeah. Uh, when you step back, you can see the full picture. And uh, and, and that's exactly uh, in reading your book, uh, the parts that I um, had an opportunity to really dive into. Um, I totally agree. She was multifaceted. Mm -hmm. uh, and now you put her in the black intellectual tradition. Can you talk a little bit about this black intellectual tradition? Because I want to come back because you also frame her as a public theologian. Mm -hmm. So first talk about this black intellectual tradition and that um, some people know about, but others may not really know about. And then I wanna come back uh, and, and follow up with the public theologian piece. Yeah, sure. For her, it was both and not either or. Yep. For me, I define the black intellectual tradition as the aggregate genius that African descended people have produced in and through their various sojourns and various um, spaces and sites in the world. And so um, Burroughs is one who contributes to that tradition. And you spoke about the public theologian piece. She is one who is in that social gospel tradition, but how do we marry that with the, with the intellectual tradition? When you look at Nanny Helen Burroughs' life, religion, Christianity specifically, is the infrastructure, is the dominant infrastructure through which every other major idea in her life is articulated, right? So again, speaking about intellectual traditions and the way that uh, Black folks make sense of the world, for, for Nanny, um, Christianity was that infrastructure through which she made sense of the world and through which she saw what her purpose was and um, through which she defined her mention. Her, her mission. So to marry that with the black intellectual um, tradition, it is a kind of tradition in and of itself. A lot of times we like to separate whether, you know, if you're in theology, you know, you, you forsake the intellectual or what have you. For her, it was both and, right? Um, again, going back to that concept of being thinkers, um, so much of her life, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but so much of how she saw her mission was to help um, was to help black folks embrace their own humanity, but then their own genius, right? And to use the raw material of that genius to build and create a reality that they wanted to see. Oh, I think you're so, on. Here. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting excited. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to just calm down just a little bit because. <laughs> See, I can just, we can just go, we can stop here and take that, that, that um, uh, exit ramp and we can right. just talk about the black <laughs> intellectual tradition and that foundation, which you were talking about Christianity. We are part of, and you are uh, presenting this book talk as part of the Benjamin L. Hooks uh, Institute for Social Change. Ben Hooks himself was the pastor, Reverend, you know, attorney, mm. but grounded in everything that he did in the civil rights movement, first and foremost, started with his grounding as a Baptist preacher. And so when I'm reading about Burroughs, I'm like, oh, this all connects. So, oh, yeah. so there is no separation no. Uh, at least for me and, and the figure that I study, Bishop Henry McMill Turner. Right. I place him in the prophetic tradition, uh, as well as the black intellectual tradition, because they are doing work. And all of these figures really in the 19th century uh, are fascinating. They are doing the work of the mind. 
being grounded in this, this, this idea that equality is actually for everybody. Mm -hmm. And let me go out and try to uh, um, show that and demonstrate that the best way that I possibly can. So, yeah. uh, oh, like if I said, I can, if I can, if go I ahead, can jump in here. This. If you were to ask, if, if Dr. Burroughs was here today and you asked her to describe herself, she would have described herself. She would have said, I'm a woman of God first, right? I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. That is how she sees herself, right? That is how she executes her mission. She literally, um, she she sees herself in a missionary vein so this is not anything that that that's that's separate for her it is endemic to who she is right she sees herself as a soldier in the army of the lord right one who is endowed with the mission that she has to carry out everybody else may not understand it right and they may not be able to receive it but nevertheless i have to um to stay on the upward way. Um, so she, there, there's this thing about going up the, the rough side of the mountain. She didn't want to go up the smooth side of the mountain, right? She said, let me go up the rough side because on the rough side is some rocks that I can step on that'll help me get to the top, right? If I'm on the smooth side, I might slide down. So yeah, this is the, the, her, who she is as a woman of faith. That is the infrastructure, right? Once, if you want to understand who Burroughs is, you have to first enter in through um, through, through, through that portal. And it allows her then to use that as a launching pad to mm -hmm. do the things that she um, did, um, the opening up of the school to yeah. uh, be um, with the National Baptist um, um, Women's Convention for all of those years to, um, to work with, oh, I'm just getting ahead of myself. Oh my God, this yeah. is great. Uh, can you talk a little bit more though because you, we, we did mention about the prophetic tradition and you even place Burroughs um, or what you call Burroughs in your um, book, uh, quote, a prophesying daughter, of course, taken um, from um, Chanta Haywood's work. Can you unpack what you mean by this? And keeping in mind that we already talked about the black intellectual tradition and the public theologian and how she's framed. So how is she now a prophesying daughter. Yes. So uh, I believe in exegesis and not eisegesis, right? I have, a, I have a degree in theology. So for those who are watching, eisegesis means that when you approach the text, you put your own meaning on it, right? Exegesis is when you interpret the text um, within context. Burroughs as a prophesying daughter, she sees herself in a as, as, a, as one who was crying out almost in the wilderness, as one who has been sent by God to accomplish a grand um, work in the earth. And part of this is connected again to how she's reading scripture and applying it to her life, right? There's a scripture that says, in the last days, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. She sees herself as a prophesying daughter, as one who was a part of uh, that eschatological edict. In theology, eschatology is just a big word that means the end of all things or the last days, right? The end of time. So she sees herself as a part of the fulfillment. She sees herself as the manifestation, as one who is a manifestation of that prophecy, that in the last days, your sons and your daughters, not just sons, but and daughters, which means women have an inheritance in this too. If you don't allow the women to uh, take a seat, you're cutting off half of your ability. So again, as a prophesying daughter, she sees herself or she places herself really, the way that she moves in the world is grounded in um, this greater plan that she understands that God has for humanity. And so she sees herself um, working out her mission, right? She calls her school God's city on the hill. As a matter of fact, she didn't even own the school that she founded. She says it doesn't belong to me, it belongs to God. So everything in her life is rendered in deference to that core understanding that first and foremost, my job is to be a prophet. What is the job of a prophet when you reach when you read scripture to uh, rebuke, reprove, to bring correction and instruction? She sees herself as rebuking those who need to be rebuked, people who need to be reproved. She sees herself as bringing instruction, helping folks to understand how they need to live, right? Righteous instruction. What is the right way you need to go? 
She sees herself as bringing correction, right? The structures in society that um, systematically oppress people. How is it that we apply our lives to change that? So again, the, the, the concept, or not even the concept, but her disposition as a prophesying daughter is one that is immediately and robustly informed by the way that she reads scripture and how she interprets that for her own life, right? Not seeing the fact that she's a woman as, she, as, as a deficit, right? But as something that allows her to be victorious as, as a part of God's great plan for what she understood to be um, in, 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 in these last days. Wow, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. If you're just joining us, uh, welcome, first of all. Uh, powerful conversation going on. So if you missed the first part of this, um, when this is all over on Facebook, right here at the Benjamin L. Hooks Facebook page, you need to go back and watch this whole entire episode. Kalisha Graves is doing a wonderful job at um, explaining, unpacking Nanny Helen Burroughs, uh, a um, powerful mosaic of a woman uh, doing one um, that did wonderful things. Um, mm -hmm. So I just want to um, reset the room, invite people. Thank you for coming in. More people are coming. Please click the share button. Uh, click that share button so other people can know that we are live right now talking to Kalisha Graves and we're talking about Nanny Helen Burroughs and her book, uh, Nanny Helen Burroughs, uh, a documentary, documentary portrait. Um, I want to go to the questions, some of the quick, like I said, I have all the questions, but I do want to go um, to um, some of the questions that have been posed on Facebook. Uh, and since we were talking just briefly earlier about the uh, intellect, the Black intellectual tradition, I want to ask this question. How does the Black church provide a space where Black women can act as intellectual? And I believe that is Dr. Beverly Bond's question. Dr. Beverly Bond is a um, historian, a history professor right here at the University of Memphis. And I had the pleasure of having her as one of my committee members. So, you know, I had to ask that question. So how does the black church provide a space for black women uh, so they can act as intellectual? Yeah, indeed. Um, I think if we follow Dr. Burroughs' example, you don't wait for somebody to give you a space, you create space, right? You create territory that you can, um, that you can maximize. And so looking at Dr. Burroughs' example, she didn't she didn't wait on anybody. <laughs> this was part of some of the issues she ran into <laughs> within um, her denominational circles, right? They would be like, why don't this girl sit down somewhere? Because she was doing, she wasn't so concerned about asking for the space. She was like, look, I'm going to go out here and eke out an existence for, um, or eke out a space where I can manifest my purpose. And so I think it's very simply, um, doing the work, gathering those in spaces and, and platforms don't always have to be, you know, the pulpit. It doesn't always have to be an upfront position, right? It can be simp simply the act of gathering together, right? Gathering women together, um, uh, creating a space where your, particular, um, where your particular contribution can be made. So looking at the example of Burroughs, if we would just start, right? She would, um, when she was in Kentucky, she would have the equivalent of what you would call night school. She would gather women and girls together and just teach them, right? Nobody had to tell her to do that. She just did it. So I think um, women's responsibility is to carve out a space where you can manifest your genius, um, understanding order, of course, but um, just simply doing the work, right? It, you, you don't, one of Burroughs' thing is, I don't have to um, ask, uh, being in the prophetic tradition, I don't have to ask to be prophetic, right? She just was, <laughs> she just spoke. Um, when she would speak at events, you know, it, it was like, what is she going to say? You know, you, you really couldn't try. And when you read her words in the book, it's like, wow, how is she saying this stuff? Um, sometimes, you know, she could, she could, um, 
be quite um, scathing in, in, in her rebuke. So I think it's very simply um, doing the work and, and carving out that space. I don't know if that's a sufficient answer, um, but um, I, I hope that will suffice. No, no, that's good. That's good. So she's, she's, she's grounded in this um, Black intellectual tradition. She's grounded in this prophetic tradition as well as this public theologian tradition. Talk a little bit more about her importance as a figure worthy of study, because I'm looking at some of these Facebook comments and people are now wanting to get the book. And, and by the way, the book is awesome. The book um, is a collection of her writings and speeches. And so you hear uh, uh, her voice, you read her words, uh, and they leap out at you uh, on the page. But here's the question. Why is all of this important? Why should I, if I'm a student, study, especially as it relates to civil rights? Let's focus right there on civil rights and tell us what did Nanny Helen Burroughs do as it relates to um, civil rights and the movement of Black people um, to the next level? Right. So part of her contribution to the civil rights um, era, if you will, is primarily through the platform of education. She begins the National Training School for Women and Girls, which she sees as um, a way to help create or not even create, but cultivate a fleet of um, thinking, a league, if you will, of thinking women. She is participatory in politics. She was president of the Republicans Colored Women's League. She's a part of the National Association of Colored Women. I mean, she's a part of the International Council of Women of the Darker Races of the World. Uh, she works at one point, one of the presidents called upon her to do a study on Negro housing. She also is president of a wage earners association where she's fighting and advocating for um, equal wages for for folks. So her her wings, if she spreads her wings, if you will, widely over a variety of different issues. She's also um, deeply involved in 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 the right in suffrage work and helping mm -hmm. to um, promote the vote for for women. And specifically, um, her role was helping to educate or prepare black women, if you will, for, mm -hmm. um, for the vote. So at mm -hmm. one point you'll see, she sends out uh, little surveys trying to gauge, right? What, what's the level of knowledge um, among said group of people about A, B, C, or D related to um, politics. So again, it's not one civil rights contribution. It's a variety of things that she does over her lifetime that she that she does that contributes to the uplift of people, right? If you just understand civil rights as, um, as how we see it in the 50s and the 60s, where you see a lot of the marches and things like that, you'll miss it, right? The spirit of civil rights is how is it that we uplift people to a better quality of life? And so if we frame it that way, we see how Burroughs is widely engaged in activities, right? In activities, in mission work, that helps her contribute to the uplift of people um, in general, but black people in particular. And, and she actually foreshadows, from my understanding, now you can correct me if I'm wrong, you're the expert, but she foreshadows a lot of the movement that happened in the 20th century in the quote, civil rights era. And speaking of voting rights, speaking of, uh, um, um, you said about wage, uh, wage earners, uh, um, associations working. Uh, and I think it was Hoover's presidential cabinet uh, mm -hmm. working um, 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 in there. She's also foreshadowing stuff that civil rights leaders and civil people who, quote, unquote, are in the civil rights movement are doing today, especially as it relates to voting rights. Yeah. So um, she is not only uh, advocating for the right to vote, but when you get the right to vote, then let's be educated about the right to vote so we can begin to have folk in office that would at least, 
you know, listen yeah. to our concerns. So, uh, and it all comes out again of this thinking tradition that you mentioned uh, earlier, this black intellectual tradition. Um, if, I, if I could say yeah, this, Bur Burroughs was not just, um, we talked about being a prophesying daughter, et cetera. And a lot of that mm -hmm. is about the rhetoric, right? The rhetoric that she dispenses, the rhetoric that she disperses. So she wasn't just prophetic in words, but she was prophetic in deeds. She was prophetic in action. So that a, a lot of the things that she did in her life did um, foreshadow a lot of um, what you would see in the later civil rights movement. She's she's a a mentor of sorts to Dr. K. She knows his parents, right? You you'll see letters exchanged between them. So um, she her influence, right? The bandwidth of her influence was marvelous in scope, and um, the dimension of her impact has spanned dispensations. And so. I'm just glad that now, now seems like a, just such an opportune time for the words of, Bur of Burroughs to come to bear upon many of the issues that we're facing today. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, you know, another thing that I like about the book is that you did not shy away from a tough subject. Uh, and I know I had to deal with it as well when I did my work on Turner. And that was the topic and discussion about slavery. Can you talk just a little bit how Burroughs interpret uh, the institution of slavery and how she used that interpretation to further, um, further move black folk uh, on up, if you will, or to give them still some hope that they can still make it. Yeah, Burroughs was, um, she was dynamic, um, but she also had, um, she, she could, folks could take what she said to be offensive, right? She said slavery was a, was a success. That's, that's the quote she used, that slavery was a success. If you were to say that now, people would run you and me off the stage, <laughs> right? But she, she sees it, um, again, within a very particular context. For Burroughs, she frames the experience as one that is redemptive, right? In the book, I call it an axiological renovation. Now, for those who will be watching, axiology is a big word that we use in philosophy that simply means values, right? Axiology means values. So she achieves what I call an axiological renovation of how she reads the period of enslavement. So what she's doing is changing or shifting how the experience is interpreted and evaluated in the lives of the people who experienced it, right? Or the descendants of those who experienced it. She sees it again, tied to the concept, looking at her uh, Judeo Christian faith, she sees it as part of a longer redemptive narrative, right? She literally sees the, or understands the presence of black folks in America as a redemptive force, right? That the dastardly middle passage, that the ugly experience, the bloody and sweaty experience that characterized the middle passage, that all of that suffering was redemptive, right? That the way she sees it is that through that experience, God was bringing a group of people into this hemisphere who would, by virtue of their suffering, have the moral upper hand, right? And by virtue of that moral upper hand, be able to bring redemption, right? Redemption to the land in which, or the land that they were snatched into. So it sounds controversial when we say it now, but also, in, in terms of how she understands um, the missionary, what it means to be a missionary, she sees that experience as lifting folks up from darkness into light. So again, her, her formulation of it is not one, she, she does not, her thing is this, as dastardly as, as the experience was, we still emerged as conquerors, 
right? That we are still conquerors, that you are not the victim, but rather the victor. And if you can embrace and or, or understand the experience as one that brings you to a place where you are a conqueror and a victor, right? Then you now have the power to redeem all of the ugliness and the evil that surrounds you. So her, the way that she reads the period of enslavement, she does not condone it. I wanna be, let's be clear about that. She does not condone the institution of enslavement, but what she understands or the way she understands it rather is that it was part of a redemptive purpose, right? That black folks being snatched into this hemisphere was part of a redemptive plan, right? Whether people say that's right or wrong, that's how she understood it. We're talking to Kalisha Graves, the author of Nanny Helen Burroughs, documented reader. Um, we are having a wonderful conversation, a wonderful discussion tonight. Uh, we encourage you all that's watching on Facebook to click those share buttons and share um, this talk so that people would know that we are live right now. And if you miss any part of this, as soon as this is over, it will be up on uh, Benjamin L. Hook's Facebook page. Uh, it will also be uh, on uh, uh, our Twitter handle, um, at Hooks Institute on Twitter. So you can um, check it out there as well. Let me get to another question from um, the Facebook audience. Um, one of the questions, early in the 20th century, Dr. Burroughs talked about, quote, how the sisters are hindered from helping. And this person wants to know, do you still believe this to be a reality or have things changed a little? <laughs> yeah, no, I think there's been significant progress um, in terms of the platform that women are given to contribute. As I mentioned earlier, now it's just a matter of women being having enough courage to carve out space um, for themselves. So we've certainly made, um, like Mrs. Coretta Scott King used to always say, freedom is one and, and you never really, you know, get to, you never really, uh, it's never really one, you have to fight for it in every generation. But we've certainly made significant progress since, you know, 1900 when Burroughs, 120 something years ago when she gave that message. Um, so I think now, especially, um, women have an even greater platform to be able to make um, contributions. And for those of us who do have the privilege of making contributions, it is our duty and our responsibility to lift up our sisters around the globe um, who may not have that same opportunity. We're talking to Kalisha Graves. The book is Nanny Helen Burroughs, a documentary portrait of an early civil rights pioneer, 1900 to 1959. Uh, I wanna go back to the Facebook um, question board here. Um, someone asked, how does the thought of salvific contribution to uh, a salvific country, uh, uh, contribution how does that attach itself to the myth of the strong black woman? Hmm. Or does it? How does the, say that again, that's a, okay. that's a question. I think, I think, I think the, uh, the, the, uh, the person is asking about, because when you just explain about this whole notion of redemption, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and let's not forget, Du Bois, this is Du Bois's argument. This is King's argument. This is a whole lot of the Black theologians' argument, this whole notion that there is a special gift, the soul of Black, this special gift yeah. from Black people to, to kind of redeem uh, America and then redeem whiteness even. But in, in the hands or out of the mouth of a Black woman, does it contribute to the myth of this strong black woman that a black woman got to be everything, got to do everything and hold up and redeem everybody, uh, <laughs> even to a fault not taking care of herself? <laughs> right. Um, if we were to rely on the words of uh, or rely on Burroughs in context, I think she would say my grasp 
in terms of understanding who I am, right? And what my call is does not absolve you of the responsibility to do what's right, right? So even within this context where she sees black folks as a redemptive force, as a redemptive force, she doesn't absolve anybody of responsibility, right? Her thing is like, it's almost like the, the scripture which says you have to work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling, right? So her thing was like, let's get us right, okay? Let's, let's get our, let's get the contours of our mind right about who we are. Doesn't mean that we absolve anybody else of responsibility. Doesn't mean that we absolve um, systems of the of, of the responsibility to make amends, what she's trying to do is to help reshape the contours of black thinking, right? She, and I often say that she did not see herself as a Negro whisperer, right? She didn't see herself as somebody who was interpreting black concerns to, to white people's ears, right? That's not who she was. Her thing was very, she was very intra-racially focused, helping to get the contours of our thinking right, helping us. She has um, a, a piece in the line where she says, you know, stop, stop playing white, 12 things that Black folks need to, to start doing, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, in terms of feeding into the myth of a strong Black woman from borough standpoint, it doesn't because even in her, um, even in her drive to change the contours of thinking, right? To change how people are um, in terms of their disposition, right? Toward suffering, she's not absolving the other from um, the, the responsibility to make amends. So I hope that answers the question. That was a good one though. Mm -hmm. uh, and a great answer as well too. And it leads me to, uh, to a question that I want to go back to and then pull up uh, for right now. And I want to talk about that civil rights, um, um, her civil rights work again, as it relates to community organizing, the whole notion of or organizing the women that she organized. Can you talk a little bit about that and talk about the importance of organizing all of these women to do these wonderful things that all of these women did once they were organized and once they began to believe that A, they could do it, and B, that, um, that there's no one, if we are together, that can really stop us. Mm -hmm. Right, no, she, she definitely believed that there was power in unity. And one of the emphasis, emphasis that she made sure was known at her school is that she said, for as much as we are, you know, training these girls, these women to work, I also want them to be, to be able to think and to not just think um, in, in, internally, but to think publicly, to be able to defend themselves, to be able to um, contribute, to be able to make a stand and be able to um, give an answer, right? To give an answer for the hope that lies within. So, um, her her mission to uplift black women was multifold. One of the things that she sought to do was to help black women to know that their labor had dignity, right? Um, she saw a lot of her work as restoring virtue, restoring virtue to a group of women, to a race of women who had been systematically and routinely and serially dehumanized and, and degraded. So, so much of her work was about restoring virtue to women who, who, whose virtue was snatched by virtue of very, the, the trauma of simply, you know, being black at many times or being subject to a variety of different assaults. So a lot of her work was about how do I um, help black women to be thinkers, right? To be bold thinkers in public. And then how do I help them to know that their labor has dignity and that they have the capacity to, um, uh, to make a change. But then she also um, was really invested in black women having an infrastructure through which they could do their work for instance, an, an economic infrastructure um, through which they would be able to accomplish a work. So her call to black women is multifold. She does, you know, she, she, she's very clear. I am creating a league of, um, uh, a league of, 
of, of soldiers, if you will, who can come alongside men, right? Now, I want to be I want to be clear about this. She does not see a competition between men and women, right? She does that. When you look at that, especially black thinkers in the 19th century, you can't impute contemporary context onto onto um, historical figures. She does not see a a a, um, a competition. What she is doing is cultivating the help meet, right? That our work is complementary. We got to do this thing together. As I said in the beginning, if you cut off women, you're cutting off half of your ability. So a lot of her justification. Sometimes some of the men in her circles felt threatened by it, but she's like, look, I ain't trying to compete with you, right? I'm just trying to ensure that we can complement each other so that the race can continue to arrive at, um, at new echelons and at new heights. So um, her, her call to women is to create a league that, that, are, that are courageous enough and bold enough to contribute and to come alongside um, the men in their lives, right? So that they could work together toward um, progress for the race. Almost sounds like a vision of womanism, uh, of working mm. together in community and, yeah. and um, moving forward together, mm -hmm. um, uh, not competing, but enjoying mm -hmm. the fruits of the labor together. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I tell you what I want to do. We come into the end. Oh my God, time sure oh, does oh, yeah. fly. <laughs> We're having fun. And I haven't, I still got half of my questions I could give, uh, get out. But, but uh, what I want to do is for the people who maybe joined a little bit late, uh, I, you know, delivered and read a, a standard bio, but I want to give you an opportunity um, just to share with us because I'm looking at some of the comments and um, you're getting some mad love, uh, Ms. Graves, <laughs> on, on the Facebook. Thank I just you. want you to know that. Uh, so I want to give, you an opportunity to just talk a little bit about yourself, your interests, uh, and maybe even some future research uh, yeah. that um, you're looking at doing. And, um, you know, so I give you this time to do just that. Yes, sir. Thank you um, for that. I, a lot of times when people describe or talk about who they are, they talk about what they do, right? <laughs> And the way I wanted to approach that is to talk about who I believe I am. I am one who is invested in sowing in the lives of people. I am one who is committed to helping others to understand what their impact can be. I tell my students all the time, I said, it's not the context of your life that matters, it's the measure of your life that matters, right? Any number of us were born into jacked up situations or <laughs> you know, have drama or, or what have you. It's not about the context, it's about the measure. And so the measure that um, I want to define in my life or the way that I apply that is through education. And through education, it gives me a platform to be able to sow into the lives of students to help them think differently about who and whose they are and what they can accomplish with their life. Um, I really see it as a, I don't even see it as a job, right? As, a, as someone who works in higher education, it's not a job for me, it's a mission. It is, an, it is a, a passion that is rendered in service. And so again, I am one who wants to sow into the lives of people and to help them um, arrive at new and daring echelons in their life. Um, in terms of my interest, I, you know, in, in academia, we have to write um, these things up in terms of what are your research interests, et cetera. If you, I like to study black people, all right? That's, that's my thing. I like to study black people, but because <laughs> in academia, everything has to be quantified, I apply that through um, you know, African, my interest in African American history and um, and and African American philosophy. I'm uh, and, and intellectual history. I am invested in understanding how Black folks have been thinking across space and time. I'm interested in exploring the contours of thought that have under 
girded so much of the action that our people have taken, right? You see the march, you see the boycott, but no, it's the it's the meetings, it, it's, it's those dialogues, it's the intellectual exchanges, it's the ideological battles, it's the tributaries in terms of their philosophies that, you know, folks are, 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 are wandering down that really um, give you a sense of who our people are. I am one who is invested in helping people to understand that Black folks have not merely been doers, but that we are seers, right? That we are thinkers, that we have, the, that we have always had impact on um, space and time. I'm, always, I'm also interested in, in, in global affairs and, and international development. I have a lot of interest in, in Africa and, and how we can use education to contribute to international development. I'm interested in U.S. Uh, U.S. Africa policy because our policy for so long has been rendered through a colonial um, lens. So I think there's an opportunity for us to rethink how we engage with the continent. Um, a lot of my research now is on HBCU sustainability. I am concerned about how we can ensure that HBCUs will endure for the next hundred years. So when looking at sustainability. Um, I'm interested in those institutional planning factors um, and, and probing leaders to understand how are they envisioning the future and, and, and what are the trends that, that they see. So um, as my bio mentioned, I, I have um, interdisciplinary interests. I, I'm a curious person. So, um, you know, it can be I, I could be reading data, you know, researching data analytics tomorrow. It really don't matter. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm just someone who I, who was who's built to learn and to absorb information, and um, that's how I have I, how I have lived my life. Oh my God, I can see now the connection that you felt when you uh, began to do research and discovered Nanny Helen Burroughs. Mm -hmm. and how she poured into um, the lives of others um, with her civil rights work, with her voting rights, her education, um, being the public intellectual that she was, being, the, uh, being in the Black intellectual tradition, being the public theologian. And um, we are just so thankful, Kalisha Grace, for you uh, finding time to stop by the Zoom room tonight to Anytime. talk about... The book, <laughs> Nanny Helen Burroughs, a documentary portrait of an early civil rights pioneer, 1900-1959, and it's published by the University of Notre Dame Press. Um, first printing was May of 2019. Um, I, we are out of time. Oh, my God, this time just flew by. Uh, enjoyed our conversation. And um, if you enjoy it, pieces of this conversation and you want to see the whole thing as soon as we finish you can look on our facebook page this video will be up it will be up on our youtube page benjamin uh hook's youtube page uh maybe in about a couple of days from now you can watch it there or you can um go on twitter and um find it um at our at ben hooks that's the Twitter handle, at Ben Hooks, and you can find it there as well. I am Andre Johnson. I am the scholar in residence here at the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute. My guest tonight was Kalisha Graves, the book again, and we will put a link in the comment section for you to get the book. I know a couple of people were saying, I need to get this book, I need to get this book. So we're gonna give it to you. Nanny Helen Burroughs, a documentary portrait of an early civil rights pioneer, 1900 to 1959, University of Notre Dame Press. And please, if you haven't already, subscribe to the YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and on Twitter, and reach out to us to be put on the mailing list you want to keep abreast on what's happening because a lot of good stuff is about to happen at the Hooks Institute. You don't want to miss it. So until next time, bye, y'all. <laughs>